thoughts put in your heart to do, there's nothing else that will make you happy. Amen? And uh, I'm just grateful to be able to preach this morning. I know my voice is not going to last long, and, uh, but hey, hopefully it will endure your eyelids. Amen? And it uh, last longer than your eyelids. Amen? Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and go to Psalm this morning, the book of Psalm. And I tell you, I'm really excited. I'm stirred to preach this message. For about a week and a half, I've been physically, uh, uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know what it is, amen? Uh, I'm not the type of guy that likes to be down and to sit down and, and to have to just take it easy. Uh, but for about a week and a half, it's, it seems like the more that I try to push and, and uh, I feel better for just a little bit and I get out and go and by the time I get home, I'm drained again. And so I, I've, been, I've been in that, it's been that case uh, that way for about a week and a half now. And uh, uh, my wife said, honey, you're going to the doctor tomorrow. I don't care what you say. And I said, yes, ma'am. And uh, so hopefully we'll get it taken care of as long as you don't give me a shot. Amen. And how many like shots? You like shots? And uh, no, I'm not talking about the shots some of you are concerned about. I'm talking the medical shots. Amen. And some of you are like, yeah, we're good, man. Pass them. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about that this morning. Amen. And uh, I'm talking about the shots the doctor gives you. Amen. And uh, I remember the first time I got a shot or remember one of the first times I got a shot. I was a young kid and I uh, went down to get a shot for something. I can't remember what it was. And, and my mom was in there with me, and, and uh, the nurse said, all right, it's time to get the shot. And, of course, she pulled this needle out. It's about two foot long. And, uh, you know, she sucked in the whatever it was, the anti-venom, uh, whatever it was. You know, she pulled in there, and I thought, I'm never going to survive this. I said, Mom, I said, I don't know if I can make it through this. And I said, give me your hand, Mom. Let me hold your hand. I'm just going to hold on to your hand. I'm just going to ignore it and just hold on to your hand, Mom. Just, just be here with me. She said, son, I ain't doing that. Grow up. No, that's not what she said. <laughs> I was holding her hand, and I looked over at the nurse, and I said, okay, I'm ready. And she looked back at me and said, I'm done. I said, well, it wasn't that bad. I just wanted you to make you feel like you were accomplishing something good, you know. So Psalm 34 this morning, I want you to remember something as we get ready to dive into this passage of Scripture. I'm glad that God can do anything that God desires to do. God can. Can God? God can. Can God? God can. Many times in our life, God uses an insignificant moment to accomplish a significant task. God uses what we would consider an insignificant moment or something to be that, that maybe we would seem to think was insignificant to accomplish something very significant in our life. For example, we're here at church this morning. How many of you were here last week? Would you raise your hand? How many of you weren't here last week? Would you raise your hand? We go to church Sunday, day in, or every other, every Sunday we, we come in and we, we come to church and, you know, hopefully that's your routine. If it's not, it should be your routine. And, uh, but we come to church and we sit here for, oh, probably about another 45 minutes. And, uh, we, we sit in a church service and we open a Bible and we read a passage of Scripture. And we give an invitation and we leave and we go eat lunch somewhere. And the truth of the matter is, many times in our life, if we're not careful, being in the house of God can become an insignificant thing. We can take it or leave it. You know, I, I know I need to be there, but there's so many other things that I have to do. There's so many other things that I need to accomplish. We live in a busy world, don't we? Very busy. We always have something to do. You know, the devil is a master at making us too busy. Because when we get too busy for the Lord, then, friend, we're too busy. As a matter of fact, when we look at life and we begin to prioritize, God needs to be first on the priority list. And if we get too busy for God, then we need to reprioritize our life. But we think about church. We often think, well, you know, I'm going to go to the doctor and I've got a doctor's appointment. Go in and sure, maybe it's something not in, we don't think is that big a deal or maybe we consider it insignificant. And the doctor comes back and something we thought was very insignificant becomes very significant in our life. A phone call, insignificant. But the details on the other end of the line 
make it very significant. Sometimes God uses an insignificant thing to accomplish a significant task in our life. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that many would consider very elementary. But I believe it is a vital part of the believer's success in their relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 34, look there with me if you would please. In verse number 12, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to have to go to this bottle every once in a while this morning. But the Bible says in verse number 12, What man is he that desireth life? And loveth many days that he may see good. I, I'm not finished reading, but I want to stop right there and say this. I believe that's the heart of every man. I believe that's the heart of every mom, every, every wife, every, every teenager. To live a good life. To see and love many days that he may see good. I don't know anybody that gets up in the morning and says, God, I just want this to be a terrible day. How many got it this morning and said that? Nobody does, right? Nobody goes to the doctor and says, Lord, I want you to give me the worst thing on the planet. Nobody does that. But I guarantee you, most of us say, Lord, I want you to bless this day. Lord, I want a, I want a marriage that, that is blessed. I want a ministry that is blessed. You say ministry, we're talking about church. Understand something, sir, ma'am. Your life is a ministry that God has given you. I want a ministry that's used to the Lord. I want my children to grow up and honor you, God. I want to see good. I believe that's the prayer of every person that's ever lived. God, help me live a life. Help me see many days in the good. The Bible says in verse 13, Keep thy tongue from evil. In thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. And his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off from remembrance of them. The remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry. And the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. We serve a wonderful God, don't we? I love that song the lady sang. The hope of the nation, the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. Brother Craig, I want you to Turn this up, if you would, please, sir. We live in a world that's full of hurting people. You can drive outside of this church building and ride around this community. You can find people who are hurting. You can find people who are down and out, who are struggling. I think of a lady in particular who I see in our community often, who we often help here walks back and forth between certain places, and I see her often. And I'm sure she probably wonders and asks, does anybody care? Does anybody really care about where I'm at and what I'm going through and what I'm dealing with? And no matter where we are in life, whether we're someone who sleeps on a park bench at night or sleeps with a roof over our head, there's always a God that cares. There's always a God that's concerned about your life. As a matter of fact, this morning, I want you to listen to me. He wants to take this, what you may think as an insignificant moment, and accomplish something very significant in your life. Amen. I said earlier this year, when people say, you know, what makes a good pastor? I said, my thought is, I didn't tell anybody this, because to be honest with you, I don't want to take the two cents that I have and give it to anybody because I, I want to have two cents at least. Amen. Amen. Somebody says, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Stop giving away pieces of it. You're losing it. Amen. Amen. Nobody really even cares really what my opinion is. They need what God says. Amen. Amen. But I thought to myself as an individual, what makes a good pastor? 
this today is two years that the Lord has allowed us to be back here serving the Lord. Amen. Amen. It has flown by two years. My thought was this. If the people that I pastor love God and they can grow in their relationship with the Lord, then I've done what I'm supposed to do. Amen. If you love God more and you desire to walk with God more because of the ministry that God has given us, then I believe I've accomplished what God has for me to do. Because the Christian life is not about you and a church, and it's not about you and a, a pastor. It's, it's about you and God. And that's it. Out of that relationship with the Lord, those other relationships are born. Without Christ, there is no church. Church is not built upon men. It's not built upon committees. It's not built upon committees. It's not built upon the ideas of men. Jesus said, I am the foundation, the chief cornerstone. Upon this rock, I will build my church. This is God's church. It always has been, praise the Lord. And by God's grace, if man will stay out of the way, it always will be. The Christian life is about your relationship with the Lord. Your relationship with Jesus Christ. David here in Psalm 34 finds himself in a unique situation. He's running from Saul. Remember Saul? David, as a young lad, showed up on the battlefield one day and told, told Goliath, he said, today the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Goliath mocked him and made fun of him. Remember that? At the end, David pulled out Goliath's own sword. What? Took his head off. God delivered him into his hands. The Bible says that out of them all, the Lord delivered us. But David's life has changed now. That great deliverer of Israel who stood on the battlefield one day, they wrote a song about him. Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. David walked through the streets and he was a hero. People flocked to him. The king got upset. And the Bible says from that moment on, Saul eyed David. He wanted his life. And David went from being the hero and the, the most celebrated man in the nation's history to climbing out of a window and running for his life. He finds himself in Psalm 34 in, in front of Abimelech. And the Bible says that David, to escape the danger, begins to act like a crazy man. The king who, the, the great warrior who stood over the body of a giant, now begins to act like a crazy man to escape the hand of Saul. It's amazing sometimes the extent that people will go to to try to get themselves out of trouble. Amen. You say, how do you know that? Remember when you were a kid and mama would say, or daddy would say, what happened here? Let me translate that for you. That means somebody's about to get whipped. I want, to help, I want you to help me choose who. That's what a kid thinks, right? And boy, you begin to make up stories. And moms and dads, haven't you heard some of the wildest stories come from your children? Amen. I'm looking at some of your kids right now. I know you've heard some. Amen. It's amazing the extent that we'll go to to try to get ourself, listen to me, ourself out of trouble. David finds himself in trouble. And he goes through this situation and he sits down afterwards and he pins this psalm. And here's what he says. Look at with me, if you would, please, in verse number 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Get this. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. 
In other words, David says this. Instead of trying to get yourself out of trouble, let God do it for you. Instead of trying to get yourself out of trouble, let God do it for you. you. Say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? I want us to look at this passage of Scripture, and I want you to see some things in light, uh, 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 see some things about this passage. Understand this this morning. Don't be distracted by my voice. Everybody all right? Can you understand me pretty good? Never underestimate what God wants to do today. You may think it's insignificant. But I think the principle that we're going to learn here this morning is a principle that can change your Christian life. The Bible says here, David, this great warrior, pins this song. And he says this in verse number 12. What is man that he desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? I said already this morning, that's probably the prayer of every person sitting in this room. But the thing about life is, is that it often carries the afflictions, the struggles. Can I say to you this morning, no one got David in trouble. David got himself in trouble. And no one gets us in trouble. We get ourselves in trouble. No one, people say, well, well, this happened and we go back to the story of our kids and us as children. Well, he was doing it and she was doing it. And, and so I thought it was okay to do. No one drags us into trouble. We choose to get there. David chose to, to bring himself to this destination. And in our life, we arrive at many of the troubles because of our own doing. We arrive at many of the afflictions because of our own decisions. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that doesn't do much for the self-help line, does it? That doesn't do much for the ego boost, does it? We arrive at the issues in our life we struggle and we deal with the difficulties of our life because we chose to bring ourselves to that place. We made those choices. David made a choice here. And the Bible says, as we think about life and we think about seeing good, many of us could confess and attest to the fact that while we have been blessed of the Lord, there have been days that we've failed the Lord. Amen. That while we've been so blessed of God, God has been so good to us. There have been times in our life that we made choices that dishonored the Lord. There have been times in our life where we made choices that were displeasing to God. Amen. There were times in our life that we allowed sin To consume us. David said life. I want it good. Length of days. But Lord I struggle. Lord I struggle with sin. I struggle with the afflictions. And I struggle with the difficulties of life. It's bringing ourselves to that point. It's bringing ourselves to the point that we realize that number one, it's no one else's fault but our own. And that it's no one else's responsibility but our own. It's getting ourselves to that point that we deal with the difficulties or the affliction or as we're going to point out here in just a moment, the sin in our life. Look what the Bible says when we think about David's life here. Look down with me, if you would, please, in, in verse number, in verse number uh, 13. He says, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Get this. I want you to mark there in that word where the Bible says the word evil. Depart from evil. I want you to mark that word or make a note of it. And do what? Good. Look in verse 14. Depart from evil and do 
Seek peace. Pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the, mark this word, righteous. And his ears are open of their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do, here's that word again, evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous, verse number 17. And the Lord heareth, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. When you read through those verses that we just read, there's a, there's a contrast of evil and righteousness. There's a contrast of evil and righteousness. Now stay with me, please. Don't miss this. I'm going to bring all this to a point, and you're going to need it. And what you're going to get, God's already worked on me about a good bit. There's a contrast of evil and righteousness. I want to ask you a question. Do the wicked do evil? Do the wicked do evil? Yes, they do. We would say amen to that. But the Lord tells us in this passage of Scripture that we're to keep our tongue from evil. That we're to depart from evil. So here's what he says. Not only do the wicked do evil, but the righteous have the capability of doing evil. Amen. Well, wait a minute, Pastor Brian, I'm saved. I'm not evil, I'm saved. Let me ask you a question. Since you've been saved, have you sinned? Yes. You know what sin is? It's evil. We've done those things that displease the Lord. And so, so often we say, we say, well, the, the, I, I'm not wicked. I don't do evil. But when we sin, we do evil against the Lord. He says, keep thy tongue from evil. He says, depart from evil. He says to the, to the righteous, you have the capability of doing evil. And so often each and every day of our life, we prove God's point over and over again. Because each of us have the capability, as we know, to live sinfully. Well, I don't, I don't do this and I don't do that. And we begin to try to categorize our sin. Do you know, do you know it was one sin that plunged the entire human race into a life of sin? And you know what that sin was? Disobedience. What murder? What adultery? Was an abortion? Was a homosexuality? It was disobedience? That sin plunged the entire human race into the life of sin. Every one of us, each and every day, deal with sin. The sad thing is that we see so often in the culture is that we stopped looking at sin through the eyes of the Lord and started looking at sin through the eyes of man. You see, it would be much different to you if it was sin that put your son on a cross. You would have a different perspective when someone took advantage of or sped on or mocked the sacrifice that your son made so that you might have eternal life. And here's what we've done. We begin to cease to look at sin through the eyes of the Lord. And we begin to look at sin through the eyes of man. Here's what I mean. Go out and talk about sin in your community. Go out and talk about things that we know the Bible says are wrong. And here's the response that you'll get. Well, at least it's not this. Or everybody does it. You see what I'm saying? We become very accepting of what the Bible calls sin. David here is lying. He's standing in front of a king. He's acting crazy. And he's lying. Lying is a sin. Dishonesty is a sin. As a matter of fact, I want to point out just a couple of things to you. When we think about living this life, I want you to get this. Write it down. I, got, I have four things. I believe there are four things. I want you to, if you, if you write them down, if not, listen to them by the tape. It'll cost you $100 to get the tape, so write them down. Look what the Bible says. All right, get this. 
There's an emptiness that comes from trying to serve God in your own strength. I wish I was talking to someone out here in the parking lot this morning. And they made this statement to me. They said, why didn't I know what I know at 50 years old? It would have been much easier for me if I would have known that when I was 20 years old. Amen. Aren't some of you glad that, or, or don't some of you wish that you would have known, Brother Craig, turn these fans on for me, please. Aren't some of you glad that, or wish you would have known at 20 what you know at 50? We'd save ourselves a lot of heartache, wouldn't we? There is an emptiness that comes from serving God in your own strength. There's an emptiness that comes from trying to live this life successfully in your own power. Look at David. What's he doing? The great warriors pretending to be crazy. Why? Because he's afraid. David, you just killed the Goliath. David, you just accomplished something that no one else in Israel would do. And now he's afraid. Why? Because he's, he's living in his own strength now. By the way, living in the power of God is not a decision you make at an altar. It's not a decision that you make at an altar and you get up and you walk away and, and everything's fine. Understand something? Living in the power of God is a decision that you make every day of your life. David now, who stood in that great strength of God, is now running in his own might. Preachers get up and they preach the word of God in their own strength. And you know what they do? They go back and they sit in their office and they go, God, I didn't accomplish anything. Parents trying to raise their children in their own strength without God's help. And they look at it so often and they see their own failures. Amen. Why? Because there's an emptiness that comes when you try to do what only God can do. In your ability. Saul was king. David knew he was in trouble. But David had already seen a God work far greater than Saul could ever work. When you begin to try to serve God in your own strength, you'll be empty. You'll be void. You'll be, there'll, there'll be a, a longing for something more. And David's finding out here that in his own strength, there dwells no good thing. There's an emptiness. There's a void. The second thing that I want you to write down is this. That our attitude towards the sin in our life or displeasing the Lord should always be the same. The attitude towards the sin in our life or displeasing the Lord should always be the same. What is David doing? He's lying here. He's talking about, remember we contrasted uh, righteous and evil and the difference between the two. And look what the Bible says. Here's what he says our attitude should be. Look at it in verse number 14. What's the very first word? Depart, Depart from what? Evil. Depart from evil. But he does not stop there. Get this. Hey, here's the problem. Man, I wish I had a voice. I'll just whisper it to you and you yell it, all right? Listen, pay attention. Here's the problem with Christianity today. That's where we stop. What does he say? Verse 14 says what? No, 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 stop right there. What does it say? The, the first three words, depart from evil. Is that a good thing? It is a good thing, right? Amen. But here's what happens. Here's what Christians do. Well, I don't do that. And 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 boy, look at this. Here's the list of all I don't do. That's not where the verse stops, does it? Look at it. The Bible says, verse 14, depart from evil What's the rest of it say? And do good. He doesn't even stop there. How many times have you said, I'm not going to do wrong. I'm not going to do that sin again. 
I'm not going to fall into that sin again. I'm going to give that thing up. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going to stop running around. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop it. And you say, Lord, I'm going to do good. And you fall flat on your face in a week. Is that, is that where it stops? No, it doesn't. Look at, look at it. Everybody good this morning? Depart from evil and do good. What does it say? Seek. Stop. What's David speaking of there? Here's what we want, peace. We want everybody to stop fighting. That's not what David's talking about. He's not talking about a literal war. He's not talking about a, he's not talking about a, uh, Brother Elmer, a, a physical battle that's taking place. That's not what David's talking about. He's not talking about armies against armies. David says, he says, depart from evil. He says, depart from evil. Look at it. And do good. And he says, seek peace. You know where David's talking about peace? You know the peace that David's talking about? He's not talking about the peace that comes because the battle is over. He's not talking about the peace that comes because people have laid down the sword. He's talking about the peace that comes when you allow God to have his rightful place in your heart. Peace, friend, is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God. Amen. And David says, seek peace. Listen to me and look what he says in verse, verse, again. And what? And pursue it. Oh, this is so good. Man, I hope you got it. I hope you brought your big spoon today. Listen to me. You remember David? David was known as what? He was a man what? After God's own what? Oh, man, did you see it? He says, seek peace and pursue it. You know what David said? He said, I want to pursue God. I want to pursue God's presence in my life. I want to sue the, pursue the peace of God in my life. I want my life to be so consumed with what God wants and so surrounded <coughs> by God's will and God's presence. I want to pursue after that. He says, I want to seek after God's will like it is my own. He says, and in that moment, in that moment, we realize we understand exactly how God works. You see, our attitude towards sin is, is changed. Preachers don't preach on sin anymore. They become so consumed and they become so, so overwhelmed with what people might think or, or having a crowd or how people are going to work or how people are going to accept it. Friend, I can tell you this. You'll drive yourself crazy as a pastor trying to keep people. Find people. Impress people. You better, you better first desire to impress God. Amen. And if God doesn't attract you through my life, if it's not God that draws men to this ministry, if it's not the message of the gospel that changes a person's life in any ministry, then that ministry is not accomplishing God's will. Their attitude towards sin. Look what their attitude was. Look at it. Look what Dave, here's the attitude. He says, I want, you to, I want you to understand the importance of your attitude in life. Your attitude affects your choices. Look in verse, look in verse number 13. He says, keep thy tongue. He deals with the tongue. Keep thy tongue. He says, watch what you say. Watch the conversations that you have. Sometimes our, our sin is sin of commission. Things we do. But sometimes our sin is things that we should do that we're not doing. Amen. Everybody with me there? He says, keep thy tongue. Not only, not only conversations that we have, but conversations that we should have that we're not having. The, the gospel. It's a sin not to share the gospel. Their attitude from sin needs to be the same. He said, have a life that honors the Lord. He says, keep thy tongue. And then he says, the actions of your life, depart from evil. The things that we do. Listen to me, friend. It was your sin and my sin that put Christ on a cross. Christ died for sin. And David says, David says, our attitude needs to be the same. The third thing. Listen to me. Don't miss it, please. The Bible tells us in verse number, look at, look at it if you would please, as a matter of fact. 
Verse number 16. Are you there? Everybody with me this morning? Anybody being helped today? If you're not, you can get up and leave right now. We won't even charge you. Listen. Look in verse 16. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from earth. In verse 17. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and deliver them out of all their troubles. Now let's have a, a multiple choice question here. If you had the opportunity to be a person in verse 16 or verse 17, which one would you want to be? I'm going to tell you which one you want to be. 17. Here's what the Lord says about those that do evil. He says, I'm going to cut them off, cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. God says, here's how, here's how I feel about sin and those that do it. I want to cut off the remembrance of them from earth. God's attitude and our attitude about sin are two different things, aren't they? But he says in verse 17, he says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Which one would you want to be? Verse 17. He talks about evil. He talks about righteous. What did we say just a moment ago? Can, can the righteous do evil? Yeah. Do the wicked do evil? As a matter of fact, I've seen those that aren't saved do good things. I don't know if Bill Gates is saved. I hope he is. I hope if he's not saved that somebody from our church leads him to Christ and he makes up for all his back tithe. <laughs> but I've seen Bill Gates do many good things. I've seen the evil do good and I've seen good do evil. So he's not talking about saved and unsaved here. He's talking about people who, who have the capability to choose either do, to do righteous or to do evil. He's talking about those who have the capability to make decisions that honor the Lord or displease the Lord. He says you can either be verse 16 or you can be verse 17. You can either be the one that God says, I'm going to wipe the remembrance of you off the earth. Or you could be the one that cries to God and the Lord delivers you out of trouble. Amen. What's the difference? Are you ready? Here's the whole message right here. Don't miss it. Look at your Bible. Look in verse number 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Here's the difference between verse 16 and 17. It's the brokenness about our sin. You know what we do? It wasn't that bad. I've been getting away with it so long, might as well keep doing it. You know what we do? Everybody's doing it. And God says, do you know what that sin did to my son? Put him on the cross to die for you. Verse 17, you know, you know what verse 17 says? The righteous cry. You know, when you're broken, there are tears. Look in the Bible. Did God use David? Did he? You know, when he used David? After he was broken. David wept and cried all night long. Did God use, did God establish a nation through Jacob? You know what Jacob was? He was a liar. You study over there where he wrestled with the Lord. The Bible says that he wrestled and fought and argued. Until God did what? He touched his thigh. And from that day on, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. You know what God did? He broke him. Was, Saul used, was Paul, the apostle Paul used of God? He was, but you know when he was used of God? After God broke him. 
You know the problem in our life? Is we've allowed pride so often to keep us from being broken about our sin. And God can't use those who aren't broken. Remember this. Christ is not attracted to your boasting. He's attracted to your brokenness. He's attracted. He's drawn nigh to you. When you understand, the Bible says, look in verse 18. And saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. That contrite spirit is speaking specifically to our spirit towards sin. Not just sin, but the sin in our life. You see, friend, it's not everybody else's sin you need to be worried about. It's amazing. Social media is sometimes a blessing, but I'll be honest with you. I told my wife just recently, if I could go back to just a flip phone. Kids, for those of you that don't know, phones used to fold out like this. Y'all remember when that happened? They used to look like a Snickers bar. How many had a, how many had a Three Musketeers phone? I mean, it was just like a block. That was it, you know? It's amazing how we can get out, we can vent and talk, and we can point out everybody else's sin. That's not your problem. The problem is our own sin. Where's the humility? Where's the repentance? Where's the, the, the vision of what we are before God? Where's the brokenness that comes with failing a God that's redeemed us? Where's the brokenness that comes when we know that God has saved our life? Where's our brokenness towards sin? God said the difference between those that do evil and those that are delivered is a brokenness about the sin in their life. You see, when we're not broken about our sin, we continue in it. When there's, when there's no brokenness about our sin, we have to question our salvation. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Understand this. God knows how to break you. God doesn't want to. God wants you to come to him. Where's the brokenness in our life? Church, where's the brokenness about our sin? Where's the brokenness about the direction? Where's the brokenness about the decisions in our life? Where's the brokenness that says, God, I'm sorry that I failed you? The brokenness in our life is an avenue through which God can work in your life. You see, until we're broken, Herman, God's not near us. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. When we're not broken about our sin, we're not broken about our failures and our shortcomings. Here's what we're saying. Get up, Danny, help me. Here's what we're saying. We're not broken. Come to me. Come on. Keep trying. I don't need you, God. I'm good. But when we're broken... The Bible says, listen, when we're broken, what does the Bible say? The righteous cry. When we're broken, we're not like this. We're like this. The Bible says when we're there, God is nigh. Thank you. God is nigh to them of a broken heart and of a contrite spirit. So I don't, I don't know why I keep failing. I don't know why I keep falling flat on my face. I can't get victory over this thing. I can't move past it. I keep dealing with it. It keeps coming up, coming up, and coming up because you've told God you can handle it on your own. And until you're broken, God's not near. The next verse says what? And we're done. I know I've been here long. The next verse says what? Many are the afflictions. I could tell you people sitting in this room, I could give you personal testimony over and over again of multiple times God's had to break me. Why does God break us though? So he can be close to us. So he can be near us. 
You may have victory today, but you know what? You'll need God's help for victory tomorrow. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But let me encourage you. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. There's nothing that can ever impact the child of God that God does not allow. And there's nothing that you and I will ever face that God will never, that God will ever make us face alone. He's not attracted to all you've accomplished. He's not attra- attracted to your boastings. God is attracted to our brokenness. And the truth of the matter is this. Every one of us are broken. Every one of us have areas in our life where we're, we're literally broken. Don't let pride keep you from letting the Lord help you with it. The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart. Let's pray together, may we?